is there a good argument from moral knowledge to theism? That's what we'll be discussing tonight. I'm joined by two special guests, uh, Dr. Dustin Crummett, who I've had on several times. He is a professor of philosophy at Seattle Pacific University and another university uh, as well. And U U Dr. Tacoma. Yeah, University of Washington, Tacoma. That's right. And uh, Dr. Louise Anthony. I've never had her on before, though. I've, I'm a fan of her. She, she does good work. Uh, she is at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. <laughs> So thank you both for joining me. All right. Well, here's the basic structure for the interview. Well, discussion. Dustin's going to take about 10 minutes or so to lay out his argument for moral knowledge that he has co-authored with Dr. Philip Swenson, who's a professor at William & Mary. They published this uh, in a chapter in a book called, do you recall the title? Is it uh, The New Theists or something the like that? The New Theists. Something, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a link to that in the description of the video in case you're interested in hearing the full paper. But he's going to give a brief summary of it. And then for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm just going to let Dr. Anthony press Dustin on this argument. At the end, we'll try to do a few minutes of Q&A. So that's the basic structure. We'll go ahead and, and get started. So Dustin, why don't you go ahead and take a few minutes and tell us what is this argument for moral knowledge? Um, yeah, sure. And thanks, thanks to uh, Louise for uh, for doing this. You know, she's an actual epistemologist, whereas I'm really not. Um, I soon, soon, soon. I want to really. I'll barely even be a philosopher anymore. Because apparently, all you have to do to be an epistemologist is to write an article about knowledge. That's all I've done. So, <laughs> so everyone, everyone should like grade me on a curve. Uh, but um, <laughs> yeah, I mean the the problem that Philip and I see. Uh, between like naturalism and moral knowledge is one that a lot of people who are epistemologists talk about. Sorry, my cat's tail is in the way here. Uh, oh, can we get cats? Who, uh, a lot of people who are epistemologists uh, talk about there's a big, you know, discussion in mainstream epistemology, metaethics, whatever, about evolutionary debunking arguments and this sort of stuff. Um, so like really that's what we're drawing on. Um, one way to think about the problem, something like this, uh, it seems like our moral knowledge ultimately depends upon moral intuitions. Um, we can see that certain things are right or wrong, good or bad, etc. Um, sometimes we have to reason uh, uh, about things. Um, and as an ethicist, I've tried to do a lot of that. But even those arguments ultimately are going to fall back on premises that have to be justified by intuition or premises that have to be justified by arguments that are justified by intuition. Um, and so uh, then you might wonder like, okay, the basis of my moral knowledge is my intuition. Uh, like how did my intuitions learn about morality? Um, and the problem for the naturalist is something like, it's hard to see how um, like the complete explanation is gonna have anything to do with what the actual moral facts are or anything like that. Um, it's gonna be something maybe involving evolutionary psychology or cultural evolution or whatever, um, it doesn't seem like it's going to appeal to anything in the moral domain itself. Um, and, uh, you know, so you might worry it would be a little bit like, um, you know, I, I look at my gas gauge and it says that the tank is full and I think the tank is full, but then I, I realize, wait a minute, the gas gauge, what, what it reads is actually not explained by how much gas is in the tank. Uh, it's explained by something else um, that is maybe only roughly correlated with it or something. Um, and so uh, from there, there are kind of two ways to run the argument. Um, one would be maybe as a sort of, oh, and I should say the theist on the other hand, uh, I think wouldn't need to reject the natural explanation of where our intuitions come from, but they might then be able to say, well, maybe God set up the natural processes or guided them in some way or something, um, such that there's a, a non-accidental connection between uh, the moral domain and, and our intuitions. Um, and from there, there are two ways uh, to run the argument. Um, one would be as a kind of probabilistic Bayesian argument. Um, you might think, uh, look, like we could have had really misleading moral intuitions. Um, maybe if snakes uh, had evolved to be rational, 
you know, they're not social animals. Maybe they would find it very intuitive to be uh, egoists of some sort. Um, and when their philosophers engaged in moral reasoning and looked for reflective equilibrium, they would just become more and more coherent egoists. Um, and then maybe if you think about like all the possible beings in all possible worlds or something, you could imagine people having any, any set of moral intuitions whatsoever. Um, so you might think it seems pretty lucky uh, on naturalism that we almost kind of like just so happened uh, that it just so happened that it turned out that we have intuitions that are at least reliable enough that we can find out the truth when we attend to philosophical reasoning and whatever. Uh, maybe that's less surprising on theism. And so maybe it's like a Bayesian argument. Um, and I think maybe Louise, you can say later on whether this is true, I guess, but I think maybe Louise doesn't disagree with that because she, she actually says in um, this piece she wrote with Mark Linville that, yeah, are, are having reliable faculties is more likely on theism. It's just that. Oh, this... I don't think I ever said that. Oh, you didn't? I hope I didn't. I don't believe it. I think you did, but. <laughs> Doesn't sound like me, but well, maybe I changed my mind. I'm not going to. <laughs> okay. So, I'm okay. Well, that. regardless, you don't agree with it now. Um, one thing you might think is theism is, uh, yeah, like are having reliable faculty or are having re basically reliable intuitions is more likely on theism. So it's kind of like a Bayesian argument for theism. Um, another more ambitious way to run it is you might think there's some sort of in principle problem uh, for the naturalist in saying that we have uh, moral knowledge. Um, and I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to like commit to some grand theory of knowledge or some general constraint of knowledge or something like that. Instead, I want to run um, like a, an argument by analogy. Um, so here is maybe a sort of analogy. Um, so Theo is uh, a goblin and all goblins have this very strong intuition that there exists um, a necessarily existent deity called the judge. And uh, as a result of this intuition, they believe in the judge. And the judge is kind of an interesting deity because he didn't make the world. He's not active in the world in any way. He judges you after you die, but otherwise he doesn't do anything. Um, and so uh, he, actually this intuition is like the only grounds they have for believing in the judge. There couldn't be, you know, a design argument or a cosmological argument for him or something like that because he doesn't, doesn't causally affect the world. Um, uh, and then you ask, wait a minute, what about the intuition, though? He, he's not responsible for the intuition either. Um, and in fact, the goblins agree with that. Uh, and they say, yeah, we actually know, know we know where this intuition came from. Uh, the intuition, uh, we have the intuition because goblins are very mischievous. They can't be made to cooperate and be social unless they believe in, uh, you know, postmortem judgment. And so evolution had selected uh, for this intuition among our ancestors. And that's why we have the intuition. Um, it seems to me that in a case like that, the goblins do not know that the judge exists. Um, uh, even if the judge does exist, it seems to me that they don't know that the judge exists. Um, and this is true, even though there are some other nice things they can say. They can say, for instance, that, well, from our perspective, uh, our intuitions are reliable because they say that the judge exists and we think that the judge does exist. Um, and they can say, uh, you know, we couldn't have been, we couldn't have easily had the intuition and been wrong because the judge exists necessarily. We also couldn't have easily lacked the intuition. It couldn't have been that the judge exists and we didn't know it because evolutionary processes basically ensured that we would have this. Um, they can say a lot of things that are epistemically interesting, but uh, it still seems like they don't um, they don't really know that the judge exists once we realize that their intuition is kind of completely disconnected from anything in the theological domain in that way. Um, and then so that's inspired by a case from Dan Corman and Dustin Locke. Um, but then I want to say it looks to me like um, the naturalist is going to be in kind of a similar situation. It gets a little tricky depending on what we think the ontology of moral facts is, whether they're non-natural or whatever. But um, uh, the worry is the naturalist is gonna be in um, a little bit of a similar situation where it looks like you believe in these uh, these moral facts, but uh, 
you know, they're not, nothing about the moral facts plays any role in explaining why you hold the intuitions on the basis of which you believe that. Um, and so if we think that's a problem for Theo, my thought is uh, it might be a problem for them, for naturalists too. So that's basically the, the rough and the rough and ready version of the argument. Okay, good. So we're at about the 10 minute mark. So I'd like to take the next 45 minutes and let Dr. Anthony press you. So take it away, Dr. Anthony. Okay, so I want to make a couple of points about the appeals to prior probabilities and to evolution and challenge some assumptions you're making about what naturalists have to say and what follows from uh, the assumption that our moral faculty um, uh, is an adaptation. Um, but I also want to challenge this thing that you said <laughs> I disagree with, I have to go back and read what I wrote, but um, I don't think that there's any, uh, I don't think the theist has any advantage with respect to explaining moral faculties. Um, so, but let me start with the, with the other things that are sort of more, um, um, more formal. Um, so let me just check. You're not challenging the idea that we have moral knowledge, that human beings have moral knowledge. You're assuming that we do. Right. Okay. Yeah. So then you're assuming that we have evidence that human beings do make um, moral judgments and that they're correct a certain amount of time. So I want to ask you, why do you, what's your, you probably have, I'm betting because you seem like a totally decent person that you think that slavery is morally um, unjustifiable. What's your reason for thinking that? Uh, I mean, it's going to be one that appeals to moral intuition, I guess. I don't care. What's your What's your evidence that that's a bad thing? What's your reason for thinking it? Uh, I, I mean, it seems wrong. I can give arguments from other things. I believe that will also have to be justified by... So, so I think some, things like... Um, um, Human beings um, seem to be creatures that um, uh, value their own autonomy. Um, it seems uh, intuitive to me that um, it's wrong to violate another human being's autonomy. Um, I also think that the way slavery generally plays out in the real world involves inflicting enormous amounts of suffering um, on innocent beings. Um, uh, so those sorts of considerations are available to the theist, to the atheist, as clearly as they are to the theist. So here's what's common between us. Human beings, whether they believe in God or not, are capable of coming to the judgment on the basis of observations and surmises about the nature of human beings. Um, uh, as to the wrongness of slavery. Um, okay, so it's common between the two of us that we do have a moral capacity, a capacity for moral judgment that works works pretty well. Um, it's a totally separate question from the question whether we have such a capacity, how we came to have such a capacity. That's an interesting question, but it's but it's, it's a different question. And there are lots of possible stories you could tell. It could have happened by chance. The fact of the matter, however, is that the kinds of judgments we make seem to be, seem to be <clears throat> sensitive to morally relevant considerations. So that's a fact about us. Um, now, uh, what about the probability that creatures would evolve who had such a capacity. Well, you know, if you go back to the Big Bang, the probability is essentially zero. But the probability that we would be able to do mathematics is essentially zero. In fact, the probability, if all we knew was that the Big Bang had occurred and we knew the laws of nature, the probability that we would have the physical forms we have is essentially zero. In fact, the probability of any specific um, form emerging out of uh, evolutionary um, 
evolutionary processes is essentially zero. You can't predict what's going to happen. Um, so the fact that it was highly improbable that we would be, that there would ever be creatures that could make these judgments and make them on this basis is essentially zero. But it's also essentially zero. Um, I mean, if, if all you've got is the Big Bang and natural law, it's, just, it's also essentially zero that we'd be able to do mathematics. And we can also do mathematics. Um, so the fact that without knowing any of the facts about what we actually are like and the judgments we actually make and the basis on which we actually make them, the fact that without knowing any of that, we wouldn't be able to predict that we, uh, we emerged as moral creatures is completely irrelevant to the question whether we are moral creatures or not. Um, and uh, okay, so, that, so that's one point. So the fact that, um, let's see, how'd you put it? Uh, it's more likely on theism that we would have evolved to be moral creatures than it is on naturalism. Um, that's really irrelevant because what we know is that we are moral creatures. And we also know that we're moral creatures who make our judgments not on the basis of self but on the basis of, of um, intuitions about what's important to human beings, what human beings are like, what is painful to human beings, on the basis of our empathy and sympathy, our understanding that pain is something that we are all, uh, we, we all find um, uh, terribly pleasant. Um, those are the kinds, of, that's the kind of evidence we have for making our judgments and, and our judgments are sensitive to those, to that evidence. So I just don't see that the uh, likelihood from the perspective of the Big Bang that we would be, that we would evolve um, has any relevance to the question whether we do have this moral knowledge. And then as I said, the question, how do we get to have it? That's interesting. But I think it's equally interesting how we got to be creatures that could do advanced mathematics. I mean, those of us who can do math, advanced mathematics, but um, uh, uh, you know, I don't think that um, uh, the incompleteness of arithmetic plays a shaping role in the emergence of our cognitive capacities. Um, who knows? Um, you know, some some random mutation gave us a cognitive system that enabled us to do that. Um, maybe there's no selectional advantage or selectional story to be told about. At all. So the second point that I want to make. Um, oh, so it's so, okay. So you appealed. Um, you appealed in the paper that you wrote with uh, Philip Swenson that I read uh, to this consideration that Sharon Street raises. She says uh, she, she makes the argument that if if natural selection didn't shape our moral capacities. Uh, didn't condition the development of moral capacities by moral considerations, moral facts, um, that we were in the situation of um, saying, well, if you start out uh, in a sailboat without any rudder, without any plan, um, what are the chances that you would get to Bermuda? She says they're virtually uh, nil. Um, I want to say that that's correct. But if you land, <laughs> And I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow some rhetoric from the philosopher Roger White here. If you land and um, you know they're playing reggae on tin drums and somebody comes up with a rum drink for you and it says welcome to Bermuda and um, all that's going on, you have evidence that you've landed in Bermuda. Who would have thunk it? But there you are, and there's the evidence that that you're there. Um, so then the second, th do you want to just pause there, or should I should I go on to the other? I, I think it would be good to pause here. I think okay. you're, you've made the point clear now. So Dustin, what do you think about that? Yeah. So I think there were a couple points there. Um, okay. So the, the thing that I had thought that you said in the paper was that like there being agents with moral knowledge is likely or on theism or not. And I think you just said that again, didn't you? Right. You just thought no. that wasn't a problem. For them. No, I don't. I, I actually don't think that. I think that I don't think. Oh, um, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Even if it were true. That it will uh, okay, on so theism. You know, we're talking about moving the needle up an <clears throat> imperceptible notch over the huge improbability that uh, that creatures like us would develop given just the big knowledge of the Big Bang and laws. Uh, mm. So I guess I'm thinking that uh, on theism, it's not like us specifically 
you know, like me having like the exact genetic code or whatever. That's that's super unlikely on any view, I guess, any like non super intrinsically improbable view. Um, I guess I'm thinking on theism, uh, there being like natural processes being such as to produce uh, beings with moral knowledge is not super unlikely because we can see why reasons why God might be interested. Well, we'll in, get to that. We'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. So we can see reasons why God might be interested in producing um, beings like that. Uh, and if that's right, if if it's likelier on theism than on naturalism, then that now, doesn't what mean. I'm saying, what I'm saying is that that whether or not you're correct about it being likelier is irrelevant because the evidence we have that we are these creatures, we have these capacities, screens off all of those prior probabilities. They just don't matter anymore. We know what we're like. We, yeah, we know. We know. We so uh -huh. here we are. So that's, it's no longer an issue how likely it was that we would have evolved. We know we have. Uh, so I was thinking there's a kind of, set aside the question about naturalism being compatible or not with knowledge grant that it is i was thinking uh like general bayesian framework if you have an observation it's predict it's like much more likely conditional on one hypothesis rather than another then it follows that it's evidence for that hypothesis yeah, but, or you've the got, other. but you've got to conditionalize on the total evidence if you're bayesian and on the total evidence um the 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 prior probability uh the 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 likelihood that we would evolve given theism or the likelihood and the likelihood that we would evolve given uh naturalism those just wash out because the total if, if the question is are we moral creatures uh do we have these capacities uh the evidence that we've got the total evidence makes it overwhelmingly likely regardless of how likely it was um what the likelihood was when we didn't have the evidence. So Bayesianism doesn't support you here because you always have to evaluate. If the question is, are we moral creatures? It doesn't matter what the probabilities were when we look when, when we go back to the Big Bang. It matters what the probabilities are now, given the total evidence. And given the total I, evidence, you and I agree, it's overwhelmingly uh, probable that we have a moral capacity. I, I was thinking from the perspective of like this way of running the argument as a probabilistic Bayesian argument. Uh, the question is not, are we moral creatures? We just grant that we're moral creatures. Uh, the question well, is, was this better predicted by one theory rather than another? That doesn't matter um, at this point though, because we don't, we don't need to calculate. Uh, we're not making a prediction anymore based. Um, look, suppose that, um, Suppose that somebody, I, I have an actual case of somebody winning the lottery. What are the priors that somebody would buy a lottery ticket and it would win, you know, this mega jackpot? One in, I don't know how many lottery, uh, well, I mean, it's, it, it, I think I said 292 to one, but that's way too low. I made a mistake. It must be something like 292 million to one that somebody would have the lottery ticket. Okay. So, what does that mean? Does that mean if I'm holding a ticket and I look at the number and it's the same number as the thing there on the TV and I ask my friend and my friend says, yes, it's the same. And I take it down to the lottery office and I say, yes, we're going to pay it out, right? The, the prior probability just doesn't matter anymore. It just doesn't matter. In fact, by your reasoning, the lottery commission should say, Sorry, we can't we can't pay out the uh, we we can't pay out your earnings because the prior probability that you have a winning ticket is so low that we're not gonna we're, you couldn't possibly be correct. I mean, once you've got evidence that directly makes extremely probable the situation that you're uh, that you're considering. The the, um, the 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 probabilities, the likelihoods before you knew all of this evidence just wash out. They're just screened off. They don't matter. Uh, suppose we, we, we yes, we, I agree. You should believe that you won the lottery in that case. Good. <laughs> suppose we're wondering about like two different hypotheses. Um, one is that the lottery was fair. The other is that the lottery was rigged in your favor. Uh, that you won is evidence for the hypothesis that the lottery was rigged in your favor. 
No, um, not necessarily. Well, maybe a little, but yeah. both are, but but there's lots of other evidence. It's like, very, it, I think it's well, very it's very powerful. You can't just look at one piece of evidence. You've got to look at the total evidence. You've got to look at everything you've got, right? I mean, um, I don't always conclude from the fact that I hold a winning ticket that that the thing was rigged because you have evidence about the integrity of, you know, is there a, is there a commission that is properly supervised and, and uh, do, do, does everybody agree? I mean, you have to look at the total evidence is the point. You can't just single out one particular conditional, uh, one likelihood and say that's, that's, um, that, that's got some um, epistemological priority in this case. You have to look at the total evidence. Yeah, I, I, I agree that in the end, you should look at the total evidence. So I'm, I'm thinking what that means is you winning the lottery, that is actually really good evidence that it was rigged in your favor. No, um, it's not. No, it's not. It's just, it's just, it just isn't good evidence. And, I mean, you can't say. Sorry, let me, let me, please, 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 please let me finish. Okay. Um, it is in like, according to like a Bayesian likelihood, it is good evidence. Uh -uh. The issue is that the prior prob like the prior probability of it being rigged in your favor if we don't have any other reason to think that is really really low right because there's no more reason to think that it was rigged in your favor than anybody else's we have good reason to think it probably wasn't rigged at all so it is good evidence it's just it's not good it's not evidence that makes it anywhere near believable right on the other hand if you know, uh, your child is the lottery commissioner and we know has the ability to rig it, then we might take it much more seriously, right? Um, because then yeah. I don't think the evidence is any different, but the prior probability will be higher. So what I want to say about the theism naturalism case is this is evidence for theism. It may be that there's like other, other good evidence against theism and that sort of stuff, such that it doesn't make theism more probable overall, but it just, it increases the likelihood of theism relative to what it would be otherwise. Yeah. I, well, I think we disagree about applying Bayes in this, in this case. Yeah. I think we had a, a decent exchange on that point. So why don't you go ahead and go to the next point you wanted to make? Oh yeah. Dr. Anthony. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, oh. sorry. There, there was another thing I wanted to say about, mm -hmm. um, about the, the first part. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I agree that our intuitions give us moral knowledge. I agree that whatever, atheists, theists, whatever, all have moral knowledge. Um, the, the thought is um, that those things wouldn't uh, serve as grounds for moral knowledge uh, if naturalism were true, because in that case, our our apparent evidence, we would have like a defeater for our apparent evidence, right? Because okay. we would, we would right. know yeah. that the, like there wasn't the right yeah. sort of explanatory connection. Um, and yeah. that's, okay. that's what the, that's what the yeah. goblin case was about. The goblins okay. from their perspective, it's right. actually really likely that they'll get the right answer, but there's still something weird about what they're doing. Okay. So you're, you're, um, it's not the case that us, suppose it turns out that there was a, there was a mutation and it gave us, you know, we're, we're, we're homo, we're homo the, the precursors of homo sapiens, and there's some kind of cosmic ray, and my kids um, uh, have moral capacities and mathematical capacities, right? What, is, what do these capacities give them? Well, in the case of mathematics, it gives them the capacity to consider evidence to come to reasoned conclusions about the mathematical structure of the world. The fact that it happened by chance does not defeat the evidence that they have when they reason mathematically. And that's the same for moral capacities. The fact that it happened, if its genesis was by chance, that is not a defeater in the epistemological sense, it's not a defeater for the evidence that we have for the moral judgments that we make. Yeah. That's just, it's just a mistake to think that a chance, a, I mean, t take this, suppose that um, uh, God is giving everybody a computer and um, uh, he, he decides, and I think this is a sort of a God-like thing to do. He says, I'm going to give half of them messed up computers. I'm going to give half of them 
excellent computers that never make computational errors, okay? So you've got a computer. The chances are 50-50 that you've got a good one. If you've got a good one, the computations are reliable. And the fact that it's just chance that you've got a good one doesn't mean that you are not justified in believing what your computer says. So even if it was just as you know, a matter of sunspots that we have these capacities, if the capacities enable us to condition our beliefs properly to the relevant, to the pertinent considerations, like facts about people's suffering, facts about um, uh, the value of concern for human, for other human beings, love for our children. If all of those things are properly informing our judgments, so is a cosmic accident. The point is we still have a capacity that enables us to form judgments on a proper basis. So the fact that the origin was chancy is not a feeder for the actual evidence we have for making these judgments. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we maybe have to distinguish between like the, the origin of the capacity being chancy or, uh, and I think Philip and I weren't clear about this in our paper. So because I went back and read it and I saw, okay, we should have been clear about this. Um, we might have to distinguish between like the origin of the capacity or the origin of the belief or something and the origin of the evidence. Um, so like if uh, I have, suppose like the car, I bought like a crappy car and a bunch of the gas gauges are defective, but my gas gauge is working properly. It really is measuring the amount of gas. Maybe we think, okay, in that case, it's knowledge. Um, if I have a gas gauge that, is actually not like, it's not really measuring the, the gas. It's just like kind of displaying some random value. And it turns out by chance that it's reliable. Um, then it seems to me like I don't have knowledge. Uh, so like the worry what is you, we have what? these intuitions. Yep. Oh, my worry is we have these intuitions. Um, I agree that the intuitions actually give us moral knowledge. The concern is if naturalism is true, um, that's not, like those intuitions are not indicating anything in the moral domain uh, because they have this totally natural explanation. That's um, begging the question. Be. That's begging the question. I'm contending. So suppose you found out that, you know, you, you got your car and you're finding out, you find out, you read in the New York Times that um, half of the cars of this make and vintage have faulty gas gauges. What would you do? What would you do? Uh, if I, well, it might depend. I mean, if, well, I, if I, if it's a new car, I would probably go to the mechanic or something and ask them to check. And what would the mechanic do? The mechanic would fill the tank and see yeah. if the gauge reliably co-varied with the contents of the, because yeah. there are ways of finding out, right? You don't just say, uh oh, I don't know. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm saying that we have excellent evidence yeah. that these capacities, these moral capacities, and you have to admit this too, because you think there's moral knowledge. We have excellent evidence that our moral capacities really are tuned to morally significant features. And the only thing that you can get from this consideration of the unlikelihood is that it's chance, and I don't want to concede that it's chance, but suppose we do concede that it's chance that we have a capacity that works like that. And again, yeah. I'm going to press the analogy with mathematics. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sitting in on a seminar on the, the origins of mathematical reasoning. It's so bizarre. I mean, it's just not connected to anything that our closest primate relatives do. But God, we're good at it. And when I say we, I mean, you know, the people can actually do mathematics. But I mean, even, even the bit that, that sort of ordinary people can do. I mean, even understanding what a prime number is, is like, so far beyond anything that the our smart our smartest nearest relatives can do there just seems to have been a chip that just got added who knows it wasn't we don't it wasn't shaped by natural selection right because we didn't manifest this ability until what i think 6000 years ago is a generous estimate and of course we were already cognitively fully formed it's just a mistake to think that the chanciness of our being in a certain situation means that we have no resources for figuring out whether and whether we're in the good situation. Sorry, it's, not, it's nothing to do with chanciness. It's the fact that by my lights, 
like my evidence has no explanatory connection to anything in the domain that the really? so like the, the in my common I mean this is the case in the the Dan Corman Dustin Locke case that, that we talk about in our paper. This is also yeah, the case the in the slavery. I asked you why you think slavery is wrong, and you gave me you know you you gave me very pertinent considerations. Yeah. Why isn't no, that I, evidence I, no, I, of I, 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 moral capacity? Sorry, I I agree that. Some I mean, so some of those are empirical claims, and we can, yeah, let's grant that we have empirical knowledge. Some of those are going to have to be justified, I think, by ethical intuition. Some of the specific normative claims. Fine. And I and I I agree. Yes, ethical intuition provides knowledge. I agree. You should trust how things seem. The worry is, um, if you're a naturalist, maybe the worry is something like you wind up with an undercutting defeater because you know uh, if you come to believe that how things seem is not explained uh, by anything that's related to the right way to how they are, it seems like then the, the, the evidence that you were using, like the seeming that you were using as evidence um, looks to be uh, epistemically bad. That, that's what was supposed you to be haven't shown that. You haven't shown that. I'm saying that as far as we can tell, if we just look at the moral judgments that we make, you and I have exactly the same basis for saying We've got we've got moral sensitivity. We are yeah. respon we responsive to the morally relevant considerations. Now it's a question of how did we how do we get that? And I think that's an interesting question. I don't know that I, I, I don't know that anybody has a very good idea how to really investigate it. Although I will say this, um, John McHale has excellent evidence that um, uh, a good deal of um, moral deontological knowledge is innate. Um, mm. It's really, it's really fascinating stuff. He's got a, uh, he's got a uh, theory of a moral grammar um, along the lines of Chomsky's um, uh, universal grammar for language um, that really does a very good job explaining some um, weirdnesses about intuitions about um, this is going to not make uh, uh, trolley problems. There's a set of there's a set of um, uh, problems in moral theory. If, if any of our listeners have seen The Good Place, uh, there's a dramatization of these moral dilemmas, um, and there are some um, there are some inconsistencies, apparent inconsistencies in the judgments that people make in one set of moral dilemmas as opposed. To, as opposed to another. And Mikhail's uh, moral grammar gives a very, very nice explanation of this. But where it yeah, came from, I, I mean, there's evidence that it's there and they're very, very early, un undoubtedly. I mean, I think undoubtedly, innate. I think there's excellent reason to think it's innate. There it is. I, yeah, well, I, so I, I mean, I, I think I heard a lecture about that when I was an undergraduate actually from him, but no, I, I think, I, I mean, that story sounds very plausible to me, um, I guess. My my worry is um, so we have ethical intuitions. I agree that maybe on some sort of phenomenal conservatist uh, conservativist grounds or something it makes sense to trust those. Those are evidence. Um, if you then come to have some further reason to think that actually those are not um, explained by the moral facts. And I don't know if you're maybe you want to maybe you want to say that for all we know our ethical intuitions are explained by moral facts. What's 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 the evidence that they're not explained by moral facts? Do you think it's not a moral fact that people feel pain that that people want control of their own destiny? I mean, those are the facts that. No. Okay, so the judgment. No, yeah, yeah, I, so distinguish distinguish the claim that the moral judgments are insensitive to the moral facts from the claim that I think you and you and Philip were making that um, the evolution of the moral capacity wasn't guided by the moral facts. That's a different claim. And I'm, that's yeah, what I'm saying is irrelevant to the reliability of, of uh, I, I, so I, things like people feel pain or people feel self-determination. I don't think that those are moral facts. I think those they're are- not, just, They're not morally significant? They're morally significant, but they're not themselves normative. Um, what yeah. what it is is there's some further I mean and again you know we can if you're like a metaphysical naturalist or something we can talk about that but uh, I'm thinking there's some further fact which is the fact that pain is bad and you shouldn't cause it to people or the fact that 
people's desire for self-determination should be respected or something like that. Well, and okay, those, I mean, those I mean, sorts of facts are what are not going to figure into the explanation of um, how we wound up with the intuitions. Um, well, wait a minute. Well, no, I think that's, I think that's, um, uh, I mean, they, they figure into my, my moral determinations. You think that you, you think that like the descript, the, just the empirical fact that you have the intuition that pain is bad. You think that that is, uh, explained by the fact that pain is bad. Um, I, I, here's what I think that if you and I sat down and tried to explain to somebody else why we thought slavery was wrong, we would cite exactly the same kinds of considerations. I, I agree. Okay. So, so we have a capacity that enables us to make judgments based on morally significant considerations. Now, exactly how you codify the argument, you know, whether you have a moral principle or whether you go directly from pain is bad to we shouldn't cause it, I, I, that's, I mean, I think sure. that's, that's something that, you know, philosophers can, can argue about. I, I wonder if we could move on to a couple of other points that I think it's important to get out. Do we have time? That's, yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. And Let me, yeah, I'll say this really good. quick. So about 10 more minutes of this kind of back and forth, and then let's try to go to viewer Q and A. Okay. So let me just, let me say both of the points and then, and then um, Dustin can respond. One, one thing is there's um, uh, there's a there's a standard um, misinterpretation of the way natural selection works and its its implications for these debates uh, that I see in um, I see in Dawkins and I see in um, uh, Alex Rosenberg and some uh, atheists that want to make an argument from naturalism to nihilism. Um, but I think that it's also uh, the, the mistake is also um, uh, evident in um, Dustin and, and Phillips um, view as well. And that is that if you can show that natural selection selected for a trait because it well, natural select, that's what natural selection does. It selects for traits on the basis of uh, the uh, fitness that it confers on the uh, on the organism. Um, let's take uh, the question whether we love our children or not. So some kind of debunkers, naturalistic debunkers will say, well, we don't really love our children. We were just, our, our, we were selected for uh, caring for our children. But what's really going on is that we're responding to an imperative, to an, a biological imperative to preserve the race. This is a complete misunderstanding of the way natural selection works. Natural selection says, I'm interested in results. I don't care how you got the results. If you, if you, if your kids survive because you've got this irrational, deep attachment to them, that's so deep that it'll even cause you to sacrifice yourself for their sake, that's fine. As long as the kids survive. If it's more like, oh, I need to take care of my kids so they'll take care of me in my old age with something self-interested, or um, I really care about the uh, um, survival of the human species, so I'm gonna have kids. Evolution doesn't care, natural selection doesn't care about your motivations. It just cares about the result. So if we do better as if the hominid groups that had moral concern for each other did better than the ones that didn't, it could be genuine moral concern for all natural selection cares. The fact that natural selection only cares about survival doesn't tell us anything about the actual motivations we might have had or the considerations that might have been in our mind um, uh, to do it. So even if, I, I mean, I, I, I think there's an overemphasis on selectionist uh, explanations. Um, if you look at series biology, uh, the, the hypothesis that a trait is an adaptation is an empirical hypothesis. It's not something you can eyeball. Um, I mean, I, I like to play natural selection, why this is adaptive, you know, after after dinner and some drinks myself, but it's a game. I mean, serious, serious claims about what some whether something is an adaptation requires a lot of empirical work. The other point I wanted to make, and this is this is kind of off in a different direction altogether. I don't think theism provides a good explanation 
of why we have um, uh, moral, um, a moral capacity. For one thing, it depends what you mean by theism. I mean, there are lots of theistic systems out there. There are polytheistic uh, uh, systems. There are Manichaean systems. Um, Hume uh, outlined a lot of different possible supernaturalist hypotheses that you would have to consider in competition with traditional, with, well, for some of us, traditional uh, Judeo-Christian, uh, the Abrahamic tradition. Then I want to also say about the Abrahamic tradition, I don't think the guy who's the hero of, of the Old Testament is a very moral guy. I mean, if you look at the text, the stuff that God does, I wrote a, I wrote a paper, it was not entirely tongue in cheek, and I had been asked to, to um, provide an indictment of the moral character of the God of the, of the Old Testament. Um, uh, God does terrible stuff. He's constantly ordering genocide. He's constantly considering collective punishment. He tortures uh, Abraham and Isaac. Um, he, he um, well, I could go on and on and on with the, with the examples. There is no evidence in the text that, the, that this person, Jehovah, is a morally good being. He, he seems to be jealous. He seems to be selfish. He seems to only, he mostly cares about, about his, his people doing what he says and honoring him. And he's only moved sometimes, there were a couple of cases like with the golden calf where he only is persuaded not to obliterate his people by the consideration that uh, the non-Jewish peoples will think that he's not very powerful if he if he destroys his own people. So I, I now I know there are very I know that there are a lot of theological systems and not all of them take the Old Testament as um, literal truth. But I'm just saying that um, uh, even in those systems, I think the problem of suffering, the idea that you've got a morally uh, you've got an omnipotent omniscient being who allows the amount and distribution of suffering that you see in the world uh, makes it very, very unlikely that if there was a divine creator that he's that he's uh, morally benevolent. So I don't think the explanation is so hot to, to, to begin with. So for the sake of time, why don't we do this? Dustin, if you can respond to the two points that uh, Dr. Anthony made, and then we'll go to Q&A. And after Q&A, I want to give both of you a a couple minutes to sum up. So you, you'll get to yeah. speak again, but for now let's respond to this and, and move to Q and A. Yeah. So uh, the first point, uh, I didn't think I disagreed with anything. Um, I agree that, you know, the fact that your tendency to love your kids is explained by natural selection. That doesn't mean you don't really love your kids or yeah, I agree with all that. Um, okay. I'm, I mean, I assume that evolution played some role in the fact that, we're inclined to have some intuitions rather than others. But I don't think that um, our argument relies really on any very specific empirical details. It's it's just going to rely on the thought that not, even though morally significant empirical facts played a role in explaining why we have our intuitions, things like people suffer when you hit them. Uh, uh, the moral facts themselves, facts like it's bad to cause unnecessary suffering, those uh, I'm thinking are not going to be the things that are going to figure into a natural explanation. Um, and then uh, the second part, yeah, I mean, I agree that God is portrayed as doing lots of bad stuff in the Old Testament. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be one of these people who has one of these theolo sophisticated theological systems. Um, the problem of evil is a serious problem. Um, I, to some extent, I just want to say, like, to me, it's a, a somewhat different issue. Um, so, like, we could agree, you know, maybe this is a point for theism, but the problem of evil is is more evidence against it or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree it's a problem, um, but. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and go to Q&A. So far, I've seen, like, three to four good questions in the chat, so I'm going to ask those. Uh, this one's just kind of funny to, to start us off with. Does Dustin's cat <laughs> have moral knowledge? Um, I don't know. He, he, <laughs> you know. he doesn't have like uh, discursive moral knowledge. He couldn't explain moral truths or like conceptualize them as moral truths. 
uh, but maybe he has some other sort of, um, I, I read a book about, actually about whether animals can be moral agents once and now I forgot who wrote, oh, no, it was Mark Rowlands. Um, oh. So he thinks like they're not moral agents in the way that we are, but like nonetheless, they can have like moral motivations and that sort of stuff. So I don't know, I don't think he has the sort of moral knowledge that we have, but he might have some sort of, I actually, there are multiple cats here, but uh, <laughs> it, it, presumably they all either do or don't have moral knowledge. But, all right, here's one from, my friend, Justin Mooney, and I'm sure that Dr. Anthony Hi, Justin. knows Justin. So question, what is Luis's take on Dustin's claim that in the lottery case, the win is evidence for tampering, but the evidence is overwhelmed by the low prior probability of tampering? Um, the notion of evidence for something in a Bayesian framework um, has to be understood very carefully. How much, how much does the supposition uh, that I won the lottery raise the probability that there was tampering? A little bit. But what are we trying to figure out? If we're trying to figure out what overall is the likelihood that there was tampering, um, the fact that it's slightly more likely that there was tampering given that I won than there would be. Well, I mean, I don't know how much more it raises the probability because of course um, there could be tampering in that, that, I mean, the fact that I lost could be evidence that there's tampering too. Um, you just, you just have to do the calculation. I mean, you just have to run the thing. You just have to run the whole evidential situation um, through uh, um through the the Bayesian rule, um, and you have to use all the evidence you've got. You can't just you can't just pull out one um, one likelihood, um, and and do the calculation on that basis. All right, Dustin, did you want to add anything there? Just oh, I, I I was actually I was going to agree. Yeah, that there's tampering doesn't raise the probability that you won. Uh, that there was tampering on behalf of you raises it a whole bunch. It's just that that is like the prior probability of that is proportionally lower because we didn't have any reason to think that there was that it would that there would be tampering in your favor rather than anybody else's. So it's going to let me just say one thing about Bayesian frameworks. They don't put any constraint on the priors. So I could say the probability, uh, the likelihood that I won given that there's tampering, I can put any value on that that I want. There's no rational constraint on what I put on that. So to some extent, um, I think what we're after when we try to figure out whether it's rational to believe something um, is some background set of assumptions about what all the likelihoods are. Um, but, you know, also it's a whole, it's a holistic calculation. So, um, you know, what has to go into the hopper is stuff like my beliefs about the lottery commission and my beliefs about, uh, um, you know, the politics in the state that runs the lottery and my beliefs about the particular process that was used to generate the winning number and all that stuff. Um, so just to, just to pull out this one consideration isn't going to tell us very much um, on, on the formal framework. Yeah, I, I agree with that. All right, next question from TH. This is for both of you. If moral facts are non-causal and in the platonic realm, so I guess he's thinking they're abstract objects, how would anybody, God or evolved humans, come to know them? They are in another realm, Ben Akaroff's worry. Ben Asraf, yeah. So I'm inclined to, um, uh, first of all, Again, you can raise the same issue about mathematics. And in fact, Ben Asriff did. He want, I mean, his main uh, argument was how can, how can we know anything about numbers if they're platonic entities? I think you've got to make your metaphysics fit the facts. And the facts are that we do mathematics. And um, so you'd better have an account of, of the epistemology of arithmetic that makes that possible. I'm very inclined, um, uh, Justin Mooney knows that I try to avoid metaphysics uh, at all costs, but I'm inclined 
to the view um, that says that um, uh, mathematical facts are structural facts about the universe. And I actually think that there's normative structure to the universe as well as a uh, formal logical mathematical structure. And again, I think we have evidence that um, our cognitive systems, our cognitive and emotional systems are tuned to that structure. Um, uh, and, and that's how we know mathematics and that's how we know morality. Um, you know, theist doesn't have to disagree with that. That could be God's way of, of making it happen. Um, but again, you know, if you're, if you're not bothered by, if you don't think that we need God to explain how we have mathematical knowledge, uh, I don't see that there's a, that there's an additional problem to, um, moral knowledge. Yeah. So it, it I mean, from my, I haven't thought that much about mathematical epistemology from my perspective my inclination will be to say, oh, um, well, if these are on a par, then maybe there's just a problem with naturalism and mathematical knowledge too, I guess. So it could be that I wind up saying, yeah, maybe we do need God to explain that because there's this general problem of a priori, or a priori knowledge or knowledge of non-causal things or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, maybe, maybe I could... Maybe I would need to hear more about normative structure to hear whether I can agree about that or not. I mean, yeah, there, there is. Oh. I would need to know more about how God does things for me to feel that this is. I mean, it seems like a stipulative explanation. How do? How does it happen? God does it. How does He do it? How does a non-material being yeah. act in a physical world? And how does uh, how does God arrange the things in my the you know the neurology in my head so that this happens and. Um, yeah. You know, you don't get for free that this appeal to this very, very puzzling being um, gives us explanations that we can't get from the natural world. Yeah. Um, yeah. I So I don't think God is like directly messing around with your neurology. I'm thinking it's it's something kind of prior in our history, right? Um, resulting in natural processes that give you a certain kind of neurology. Um, but like, yeah, how, how does God do that? I guess... The, I mean, there's not going to be any very informative explanation in my view. It's not like there's a mechanism or something. Um, he just wills that the thing happens and it's, you know, maybe a logical entailment of his essence that it so, ever So we have on the one hand, the naturalist says it happens. Um, and then the theist says it happens because God makes it happen. And that's the advance uh, in our understanding. Oh, well the the advance in the understanding is the thought again is the worry will be that if the explanation is purely natural um then what i'm calling the specifically moral the like purely normative facts are never going to figure into the explanation whereas uh we can say that they figure into like the ultimate explanation why the natural processes were that way uh if we're theists now how does god bring it about um in, in the like the literal sense of like, how does he cause the big bang or how does he cause the initial conditions to be the way they are or whatever. Um, there I'm gonna have to say, there's no very informative answer to that other than he's omnipotent. And so it's like a metaphysical truth that if he wants to make something happen, it will happen. Um, and the, but I think, you know, I, I'm kind of with human thinking that at like whatever the most fundamental level is causation is going to be mysterious anyway you know we can give mechanistic accounts of how things happen but when we get down to whatever like the the basic natural elements are you know a field interacting with a particle or whatever it might be that there's no mechanism by which we can explain how that happens we just have to say it does and so um you know i i don't think that there's ultimately like uh any problem there that isn't ultimately kind of begged off even by ordinary causal explanations. So that's, that's what I'm thinking. I agree with that, but then I, I don't see what adding God does to help anything. Oh, it, well, it raises the probability that we'll, that, that we'll have moral knowledge. Because um, you say so, but I don't see why I should, I should think that. And it, it enables us to explain um, how it could be that there's like an explanatory connection between the moral domain and uh, and our intuitions because God 
God knows the moral facts and brought it about that we will. Um, okay. I know, Dr. Anthony, I know you want to <laughs> say more. We're just limited on time. So, sure. um, okay. One more question and then we're going to wrap up. So this one's from uh, Mat Matthias Dabney. When Luis appeals to moral intuitions as justification, isn't that what is under suspicion in evolutionary debunking arguments? It seems she's begging the question. Thanks to both of you. What's the question I'm supposed to be begging? Can I get clarification on that? I, I think his thought is something like what's being called into question is the reliability of moral judgments. And you say, oh, okay. well, wait a minute, my moral faculties are reliable because I've got the right answers to all these questions. And how do we know that? Well, I used my moral intuition. So it might be okay. like, like if my goblin said, no, wait a minute, my intuitions about the judge are super reliable. Okay. You know, my aunt Petunia died and she got judged by the judge. Yeah, but, but let's look at the rhetorical situation. You said, you and Philip say, right at the beginning of your paper, we had moral knowledge. We're not mm. going to question that. And if you think we have moral knowledge, I presume you think we have moral knowledge because we make moral judgments that you think are, at least in many cases, properly based on morally relevant concerns. I'm just taking over everything that you are relying on to make the claim that we have moral knowledge. So I yeah. don't think I'm begging any questions. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I agree, actually. I think that you're not begging any questions uh, or mm -hmm. I mean, Maybe there's something, maybe there's something, maybe there's something worrisome about if somebody gives you an under, maybe this is specifically the thing. Uh, I haven't conceded that there's an undercutter, that there's an under, undercutting. Uh, the, even if it happened by chance, by cosmic accident, that doesn't undercut the evidence I have for the moral judgments that I make. Oh, yeah, I, I guess the worry would be that that evidence is part of what is being undercut by the undercutting. Well, idea. that that's a that's a mistake. I mean, if you know, if you want to know whether you got whether your gas gauge works, the fact that it was chance whether you got a good one or a bad one does not undercut the evidence you have if you fill the tank and you know do experiments with different amounts of gas in the tank and and see that the gauge is working reliably. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, but that, I mean, I, I'm not saying that this is the way to run the argument, but defending the questioner, that's not a case of like the kind of, so, like the, the gas gauge is called into question, then you check it with some other means of knowing about things. So there's not like the circularity that the, the there's no circularity. Right. I'm relying on the same evidence that you're relying on to draw the same conclusion that you draw, which is that we have moral knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in a way, I agree with that. It's well, maybe, maybe, maybe I, I'll stop after this. Um, the worry is just that, like, maybe that evidence loses its force if we have a metaphysical view where uh, we think that there's not the right kind of explanatory. Condition. I don't know why the gas gauge test doesn't lose its force when we find out that it was just chance that you got one of the good gas gauges. No, it, I'm not saying anything about chance. I'm talking about a, a, an explanatory connection. It's nothing to do with chance. Okay. Well, I really appreciate you all joining me for this. And I want to give you an opportunity to, to wrap up. Maybe take, you know, one minute, two minutes to just, this isn't some formal statement, but just your thoughts on the discussion, what, what you want to leave the viewers with. Uh, why don't we give Dr. Anthony the last word, Dustin? So <laughs> Dustin, you go first and Dr. Anthony can have the last word. Oh, um, well, I don't know. I mean, um, yeah, I'm trying to think, but I don't want to deny her the last word, but I'm, I'm on the spot trying to think of what I should say to sum all this up. Um, yeah, I guess we have, maybe we had some sort of disagreement about the, the kind of Bayesian way of running the argument. Um, I, I think the other way that I suggested about running the argument, maybe we didn't quite I worry that maybe we were talking past one another or something. Maybe I didn't quite get across what I had in mind there. Um, but um, it seemed like you at least enjoyed the discussion, Dustin. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for thanks for doing this. Um, I, yeah, I mean, r really, I agreed. I agreed with quite a lot of what what you said. Um, I just didn't think that it undermines our argument. Um, but okay, Dr. Anthony, you can have the last word. So I guess I want to say, um, Dustin and I seem to agree that there's evidence that human beings have a capacity for making moral judgment, and that that capacity involves coming to correct moral conclusions on the basis of morally relevant evidence. If we agree about that, then the question is, where did that capacity come from? And my contention is uh, that, though that's a very interesting question, none of the possible answers to that undermine the reliability of the capacity because the reliability of the capacity is a matter of whether the judgments are properly based on morally relevant evidence. All right. Well, I really enjoyed getting to talk with both of you and, and here you have this uh, dialogue. And I know where I can direct viewers to go read up on Dustin's argument, but Dr. Anthony, where would you point, whether it's to your own paper or somebody else's paper, where would, you know, if maybe you had one thing that you could recommend to the viewers to see why these types of arguments don't work, what would you point people to? Um, I would point them to a paper by philosopher Roger White, who is a bona fide epistemologist, card-carrying epistemologist. And I believe he's also a theist, but he, uh, he has a very, very um, comprehensive and detailed and brilliant takedown of debunking arguments. And the paper is called, You Just Believe That Because. And I'll just note that debunking arguments are... It's a very strange situation in philosophy right now because debunking arguments are used by theists against atheists, and they're also used by atheists against theists. And the fact of the matter is that debunking arguments are terrible. That's my that's my take home. But Roger White, you just believe that because if you go to Roger White's, he's at MIT, go to his website, you'll find the paper. I'll make sure I put the link to the paper in the description right. of the video so people can find it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you both for joining me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you all for watching and keep exploring Christianity.